Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 451. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm Gavin Ashenden. It's Friday the 26th of October and the day when we remember in England King Alfred and all he did for the faith. And welcome back to the program, Gev. Do you have a new studio? No, no, no. <laughs> it's just that, uh, that, that uh, you suggested, Kevin, that my white background, which uh, gave a degree of anonymity and professionalism, mm -hmm. sure. uh, might, might give way to, uh, to, to the real atmosphere in, in my small chapel here. Um, and I've just managed to bring back out of storage my two icons, which were given to me by... Um, the abbot of a, an Anglican monastery in Sussex. Um, they they were very poor. They used to make their own clothes and live off the live off the the, the ground, and um, their icons were just posters. But um, when they got given real icons, the abbot said, "Would you? We, we're not keeping these. Would you like them?" And I, I'm I'm delighted to have them because although they're just posters, they. Um, for 20 years, they soaked in the prayers of a very faithful community of Anglican monks. And, and I think things act like sponges sometimes, and they, they soak in the love and the prayer and the holiness, and uh, I'm, I'm going to benefit from them being here. Oh, absolutely. I uh, have added to my collection behind me. I don't know which way to lean here. <laughs> uh, you can see there's a nice bronze cross back there, a painting from a friend of mine in Kenya in my guitar. So yeah, it's we, we used to have these blank canvases behind us and I'm like, you know, at some point just staring at our big faces is gonna get boring to people. We should add some flair. And this is Anglican unscripted flair. Um, let's move on and talk a, a little about what's going on in the news. Um, by the time you get to the end of this episode, you're gonna say, boy, they only talked about one thing. And yeah, probably. Before we get to the end of the episode, I need you to like it. Don't watch it without liking it first. Like it, share it. Um, we have the best commenters. At, uh, so many of you are Christian and you go there, I don't mean to offend you. I'm sorry to point this out, but you were wrong. And so you guys correct us on dates and times and places and some of the stuff we kind of screw up on in our unscripted way. For those of you who are more our highbrow audience, the podcasters, the people who listen on podcasts, you can go to Anglican, or you can go to YouTube channel we have, and in the show notes, you'll find the link to the podcast, and you can uh, uh, watch or subscribe there. Let's move on to the news, Gavin. We talked last week or the week before about um, Oxford uh, University in England wanting to invite an imam, a uh, kind of an ecumenical uh, uh, person in the Islamic faith to give the sermon at a Eucharist. And there was some pushback. I didn't hear about any pushback within the Church of England, but commenters like you and others uh, on the internet were like, wait a minute, it's the Eucharist. This is reserved for the Christians. You shouldn't have uh, any anybody outside the faith giving the sermon. And lo and behold, from our mouths to Oxford's ears, they listened and said, okay, he won't give the sermon, but he'll still be there. I, it's it's a compromise of sorts. Uh, we have other Oxford news we'll talk about in a, in a second, but let's talk about this first. Well, <clears throat> it looks as though they made a small adjustment. And so whereas he was advertised as preaching within the Eucharist, uh, and a number of people said uh, having, uh, ha having a Muslim who represents a faith uh, which calls into question the, the the integrity of the Bible, which calls into integrity the witness and the teaching of Jesus, and effectively denies it. To have him standing in a pulpit uh, in the middle of a Eucharist is such a contradiction that even the Church of England shouldn't really stoop to that level of self-contradiction. Um, well, whether or not uh, we made a difference, they did move the contribution from inside the liturgy to a few seconds outside it. So they got somebody else to preach the sermon in the liturgy, but then they had the university address uh, Im immediately afterwards. Apparently, one of the clergy removed his chasuble to show it was a different kind of event. Of course, this was the church right next to where Cranmer, Ridley and Latimer were tried and then close by where they were burnt. Um, and in a strange way, a way that will contrast with another piece of news, 
neither the University of Oxford nor the Diocese of Oxford nor nor the University Church saw any contradiction about a, a Muslim talking to Christians um, and representing an entirely different scale of values. To, 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 to the people there, it was a, a generous ecumenical interfaith activity. And there's no doubt at all, he was an extremely nice man uh, and very erudite. And I'm told he said some, he said, said such ordinary things that some, somebody left a comment saying, if you close your eyes, it could have been an Anglican vicar. <laughs> so. But that's the point. Isn't that the biggest point here? Who knows what happens in pulpits all around England from Sunday to Sunday? You get up and you hear some of the most audacious claims uh, made in the name of Christ because they're wearing the collar, they're in a church, and I don't think this guy, uh, an imam, could do any worse than some of the things you hear on uh, Sundays or throughout the weeks uh, within the Church of England, Gavin. Oh, Kevin, once upon a time when I was in Sussex, uh, I, I, I listened to an elderly, very liberal part-time clergyman preaching. And, and it, I think it was at Easter. And he was doing everything he could to undermine the resurrection from the pulpit. I, I was so upset. I came within a hair's breadth of standing on the pew and saying, stop this you know you must tell people about the reality of the living christ not do everything you can to undermine them with your third rate watered down sub intellectual under informed conflicted bigoted uh, misunderstanding of the text anyway astonishingly uh, the woman next to me we had to i didn't do it and then we came to share the peace and again i wanted to say um, to the person next to me, well, that was terrible. Uh, it turned out the woman next to me was his wife. So it was a good thing. I neither I neither said anything about the sermon or stood on the pews and waved my hands in protest. But I've never forgotten the level of profound sorrow and upset I felt that these people who come into church to hear about Jesus just got undermined in this insidious and ignorant way. Well, that was one thing. And as you say, it, it happens in churches from time to time. But to invite somebody who represents a faith that comes not only with the violence and intransigence and uncompromising hostility, not only a faith where in Egypt and Pakistan they're killing Christians for loving Jesus even as we speak, um, but, but, but who denies the integrity of the scriptures and the Christian witness. Kevin, it just was completely astonishing that the, the, the values of this place um, they're, they're willing to, to do what they did. It is amazing. I mean, we are in a completely different environment politically, spiritually than a century ago. Um, the favor giving to Islam and giving to Muslims and uh, even Sharia compliant Muslims by the press, by the politicians, by <laughs> the Church of England, <laughs> by, uh, you know, Western Christianity is amazing based on the violent history that we are all well aware of and i was reading this morning that the uh, european court of human rights whoever they are they must be important they're in europe uh, has decided that it's okay for western countries or all countries to have capital punishment no yeah i'm sorry just uh, you can imprison people, fine people, jail people who call Muhammad a pedophile. So <clears throat> there was a Mr. S. We don't know his name. He's a Swiss citizen. And he was running some kind of uh, website where he warns people about what Islam is really like. There's a marvelous guy called Bill Warner, who's an American. And mm -hmm. Bill has a very well-resourced website, which which I've watched to, to great effect. One of the things Bill does is to look, for example, as the... Uh, at the uh, Islamic battles of aggression, in other words, where Islam took the fight. Because when I was growing up, I still remember, even though this wasn't even an issue, being taught that the, the Crusades were a piece of nasty Christian gratuitous violence. That was all Christian. Um, yeah. pour, poured out upon these poor, hospitable, kind Middle Easterners who were hanging around the Middle East minding their own business. Whereas, in fact, if you look at Bill Warner's website, you see that the level of Islamic aggression was the driving force 
for everything. And the Crusades were effectively uh, a, a defense against ISIS of the day. Well, Bill Warner runs this this, this very helpful website. Uh, this man in, in Switzerland has been taken to the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, and they've, uh, one of the things he was doing was saying, you need to understand who Muhammad was. Again, I think this is very helpful. One of the ways of doing Christian education is to say, not, not to compare Christians and Muslims, because these are unhelpful generalizations. Sometimes even not to compare Christianity and Islam, for they both come in a wide series of varieties. But one of the best ways is to compare Jesus and Muhammad. Uh, and you cannot, if you do that, avoid the fact that Muhammad married uh, a girl who was between six and nine and consummated the marriage. And on the basis of this, Mr. S from Switzerland was saying, well, um, Muhammad is not the most attractive person. We don't like pedophiles. We don't like people who have sexual relations with children. Now, the European Court of Human Rights said, you're not entitled to call Muhammad a paedophile because he liked grown-up women too. Oh, well, okay. And it, <laughs> and, <laughs> that clears and it, it and, all and up. Its, judge, its judgment said that uh, any European country is entitled to fine or imprison anybody who calls Muhammad a paedophile in the public space on the grounds that you can't be 100% sure it was historically accurate and it would cause justified indignation in the Islamic community. Kevin, it, it, it's, it's beyond words. It it's beyond boggles words. the mind. Because <laughs> there are no protections at all uh, in the European courts for Jesus. Um, one day, uh, I'm sure it'd be, uh, I, I can think of all the analogies and bore you with all of them, but you know, once again, an amazing statement from the European court, which I'm assuming at some point England is trying to escape having voted for this almost three years ago. Uh, is there any update of the Brexit? Well, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, the, 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 if we we could be here for such a long time, um, <laughs> President Macron has warned that if if England doesn't pay, if the UK doesn't pay its 35 billion fine for leaving, uh, he'll blockade. Uh, he'll blockade Calais and simply stop everything going through. We we we've no idea what's going on behind the scenes, um, but the 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 difficulty that that um, the UK is having leaving is quite extraordinary. The polls came to our rescue the other day, saying, given the extraordinary threatening behaviour of the European Community, maybe it wasn't a surprise that some people wanted to leave, but but certainly the European Court of Human Rights in itself, um, I would have thought, would give most Christians pause before they wanted to submit themselves to uh, these Islamophiliac judgments. Yeah, and it, so, yeah. it is quite incredible, the double standards that our society is engaging in. Okay, double standard. I want to go back to Oxford University. Um, there's a student group there called JRC. And uh, this J student JCR. JCR. Junior, junior, junior common room. It, it's it's the it's a student group in any in any college or university. Okay, I wouldn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like it could be a digger. There, there, yeah. There's a there's a company that hires out diggers called JC. JC. Yeah, anyway, junior common no, room. Right. Okay, and they voted uh, to keep Christian Concern, a uh, ministry that's uh, based in England. Uh, to keep them from showing up on campus for summer activities and, and ministry activities because they were physically and mentally threatened by Christian concern. Now, I have no affiliation with them at all, but you've worked with Christian concern before. Tell me about their uh, threatening and physical violent activities that you've witnessed. Kevin, again, it's really hard to find words for this because they're, they're a great outfit. I, I love them. And uh, they, they, they're joined together with something called the Wilberforce Academy. And mm -hmm. last year, they asked me to, 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 to speak at, <clears throat> um, at their dinner. Uh, and I, I must say, I, I, I don't remember seeing such an attractive, intelligent, sparky-eyed group of people learning to do some really profound intellectual critique of our society from a Christian point of view. Indeed, the... the um, the rationale, the, uh, 
Christian Concerns has a residential summer camp for young people. It aims to train and equip invited students on what it means to proclaim Christ in public life. Now, while we were at the Cambridge College last year, some of the students who were staying on, on campus, so to speak, or in college, heard we were there. And they began to unroll rainbow flags from their window on the grounds that clearly they decided we were not sufficiently homophiliac and they wanted to upset us. Well, we, we prayed for them and waved as we as we they unrolled their way, rainbow flags from the window. But at Lady Margaret Hall, where Christian Concern and the Wilberforce Academy have asked to be able to spend a week this summer, uh, they've consulted the JCR, the Junior Common Room. And during the course of the debate, these well-informed, intellectually astute Oxford undergraduates have said they would feel emotionally and physically threatened. <clears throat> Apparently, they think the Christian Concern has witnesses outside abortion clinics. Uh, they've never been anywhere near an abortion never. clinic. No. As far as I know. <laughs> I'm in America, um, and I know that that's never happened. You, even Aye, you know. Uh, so uh, they they, um, they think that uh, the founder, Andrea Williams, wants the criminalization of homosexuality. Uh, I know Andrea very well. That's but, it's it's yeah. it's completely ludicrous. Yeah. What's very. terrifying? What what's really frightening is that. Uh, people are so ignorant about the reality of Islam that they're willing to accept uh, an Islamic preacher speaking from a pulpit at a Christian service. And they're so ignorant about Orthodox Christians that when a group of intelligent, dedicated, conservative Christians, conservative just in the sense of traditional, uh, arrives asking to have a summer school, um, untruths, calumnies, distortions, paranoias, fears, uh, are put around as if they're true. And um, although the college hasn't made its decision yet, the governing committee are going to meet next week, the fact that you could have had a discussion like this in a place like Oxford, with this level of distortion and untruth and paranoia, it is quite remarkable, well, uh, really rather alarming. <laughs> it is, well, it's supported by the liberal uh, academics, it's supported by the press, but and, and when a person like me, I'm going to ask a simple question, and it's going to offend us, so many people. And sometimes, some of the basis of this ministry is to open your eyes. And sometimes they open eyes by offending people. Gavin, what would a Sharia compliant imam be compelled to do with a person who is homosexually active? One of the fact things that we know is that, that ISIS has taken gay Muslims, people who are thought to be gay Muslims, and executed them by yes. throwing them off buildings. Buildings. Um, there seems to be no understanding at all in the Western mind about what Islam does when it is practiced in an uncompromising Quranic way. Um, I, well, I, I just, it's so hard to understand, isn't it? Because you're, you're dealing with a mixture of ignorance and, and prejudice and stupidity and, 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 f and fake news and misrepresentation. And I guess, too, from a Christian point of view, one has, to, one has to have the sense that metaphysically and spiritually, we're dealing with closed minds and closed hearts. But, but what's extraordinary is that from time to time, people say in our culture, all we need to do is to give people education. But if the most educated and the cleverest youth of today find themselves repeating this level of 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 misrepresentation, um, I don't know what one says after that. One yes. would be one would become hopeless. Yeah. But we have to, we have to be hopeful and simply. And if 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 at this stage, Anglicans in England would say, "My goodness." It's not just about evangelizing. We actually have to tell people the historical facts, the, the, the simple reality about who Jesus is, because people don't know. But but there is this terrible fear about articulating the faith. Uh, I have to say that in that in Lady Margaret Hall, the reports in the Daily Telegraph say that the campaign of misrepresentation against Christians' concern was led by the LGBT. Uh, faction and and it's it's again it's extraordinary that people who claim to be victims of other people's phobia very quickly turn out to be bullying manipulative um, and untruthful 
themselves in a, in a terribly distortive way. Indeed. I'm going to read you a quote from yesterday. Yeah, we'll see if you can guess who it is. I am proud to have become a Muslim. Pause. This is the natural conclusion of any intellectual theologian's journey. All scripture study leads me to Islam, which makes all of scripture redundant. <laughs> I have no idea who could have said that. <laughs> Well, she was a famous rocker from the 80s, Sinead O'Connor, number one hit from 1984. Ah, yeah, she's uh, made the news. She has switched from Roman Catholicism to Islam. Uh, she's a feminist. She's uh, uh, spent her whole life fighting against the Roman Catholic Church and complaining about, you know, some of the, some of the evils that are within it, which she's right to complain about. Uh, and then... After all that Roman Catholicism has done to women and women's rights and everything like that, she has chosen Islam. And right there, boom, she's going to be congratulated by the press. Some of her followers are going to follow her into Islam. Academics across the world are going to say, oh, she understands now. She has really become enlightened. Me, meanwhile, all Christians are like, oh my gosh, what what's going on here? And this is just part of a, a different age. It's a different century. None of this happened 100 years ago. There was some common sense within Western intellectuals, Western reason, um, and Western response to politics. All that's gone now. And it's it's been wiped out, I would say, largely by the media um, you know, the, and academia. There's no fight for critical thinking anymore. The, there are parts of Islam that, that are, are, are certainly worth looking at. Some Islamic philosophers and, and, and Sufism mm -hmm. itself, oh, yeah. which is interesting, partly because it, it becomes quite close to overlapping with Christian spirituality. But for her to say something like that, entirely, I guess, ignorant of the fact that the Christian scriptures were written down about 30 to 40 years after the death of Christ. So even John Robinson, the most appalling theologian, but a great biblical scholar said he believed that the New Testament was largely formed by AD 70, because right. otherwise it would have been impossible for the gospel writers not to write about the fall of Jerusalem and say, yeah. see, we told yeah. you so. But, but nothing was written down between, for, for 200 years about Muhammad. And there are about 11 or 12 different versions of the early Quran in existence in libraries around the world, which wouldn't matter if it wasn't for the fact that the Islamic community claims that there isn't a single mistake in the whole text. The comparison between the reasonableness of Christianity and the unreasonableness of the, of the Islamic scriptures is incredible. And that someone like Sinead O'Connor could simply say something that was utterly untrue, factually untrue. She's entitled to want to follow Muhammad if she wants to, but Absolutely. to say that, that the evidence leads her to that is, is simply untrue. So we live in a culture of ignorance and fake news, um, mixed up, of course, with this immense assault on Christianity from both the left and the right, from Islam and from political correctness. What it means is Christians have to be even more articulate, as humbly as they can, to tell the truth about Jesus and why it is entirely reasonable to believe in him. So we're going to leave this show on a high note. Never ever in the course of human history than in the last 60 years have more people of the Islamic faith come to Christ. They're doing it in droves. Uh, all of, and I guess now that I mentioned it, we'll, we'll have to devote a show just to this. I'll talk to uh, uh, yes, indeed. Uh, one of our favorite undercover fathers uh, about how it's happening. Baptisms, uh, conversions, the, the works. Also other faiths, Buddhist, Marxism, uh, they are coming to faith. Uh, and maybe this is just the press fighting all that and academia fighting all that. I don't know. Uh, but there's Kevin, spiritual... one thing. One thing we all... Well, yeah, you're absolutely ahead. right. I mean, I, I've heard too that both in Iraq and Iran, the number mm -hmm. of people who are becoming quietly Christian under the radar is is, is exponentially high. There's been a lot of talk about is, is Muslims having dreams of the risen Christ all around the north coast of Africa. What's extraordinary is the way in which 
almost as if it's committing suicide. Uh, European civilization is throwing itself at the feet of Islam. And I think one of the things that, that America has at the moment, which Europe hasn't, is it's bought itself a little bit of time. Time when I think the Christians should use all the freedom that they have to articulate the, the, the truth about Christ. In Europe at the moment, we are coming perilously close to being in breach of the law if we tell the truth about Jesus and about Muhammad. We're in a very, very serious struggle, but you're quite right. Um, the gospel is spreading very powerfully both in China and in Russia and even in the Islamic world. Yeah, indeed. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm Gavin Ashenden. You've been listening to episode 451 of Anglican, proudly Anglican, unscripted 